When it comes to Jonathan India, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You are Locked On Reds, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You our Locked On Reds. Thanks so much for making Locked On Reds part of your day. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, your Cincinnati Reds, every single day. My name is Jeff Carr. I am a lifelong fan of this team, Cincinnati Reds fan, and I've turned this addiction to this team into information for you. Uh, today, it's just going to be you and me. Steve is traveling. He'll be back on tomorrow's episode, but on today's episode, we have a lot to get to because Andrew Abbott, Set a goal for 2024 that should excite you because it excites me. And if the Reds don't trade Jonathan India, how is he going to get at bats on a very crowded infield? But let's start with this because I think we're giving up on Jonathan India a little bit too fast. There's been so many trade rumors and things like that, that I feel like there is a section of Reds fandom that is just like, you know what, whatever, trade him move on. Let's, let's, let's hand the reins over to everybody else. Let's move on from India. Don't do that. Don't be that person. Do not look at Jonathan India's 2023 and think that you know who he is because there is a stat that proves he's going to bounce back. It's one stat really. And and you're going to think, Jeff, that's too simple. You've simplified it far too much. No, it's one stat because We look at 2023 for Jonathan India, and we compare it to his rookie of the year season. We say, boy, something has really fallen off here, right? Something's really wrong. He must not be as good as we thought or something of that nature. I have found a number that will change your mind on that because in 2023, he wins the NL rookie of the year. He has a great season at the plate. A little bit questionable defensively, but that's okay. That's kind of who Jonathan India is. He is a bat first, and he's going to give you a subpar defense, but, you know, that's fine. We're talking about the bat here today. There's one number that proves he's going to bounce back in 2024, and that is BABIP. Batting average on balls in play. It's a number that we talked about quite a, quite a lot in 2020. So if you were an everydayer back then, you're probably like, oh gosh, here we go again. This number, this, this, this number won't go away. And it won't because it is a number that explains how lucky a player is or unlucky. And in the case of Jonathan India, it's about being unlucky. In 2021, his BABIP was 326. Now keep in mind, Last season, league average BABIP was 297, so he was very lucky in 2021. 2023, he was very unlucky, 281 on the BABIP. That is a 45-point difference between the two years. So the, the, the thing that we start, the thing that you see first, the thing that gets your attention is his slash line, right? His batting average was 20 points less. His on-base percentage was 30 points less. His slugging percentage was less as well. So you automatically say, well, yes, he had a worse year. But to see those numbers and think that that's who he is, that a bounce back isn't coming, there are lots of other numbers that point to that. Because I think that when you understand how BABIP influences a player's rate stats, how they influence batting average and on base and things like that, you understand why I believe a bounce back is coming. And I want to see that bounce back happen in a Reds uniform with all these trade rumors and stuff like that. There's so many fans and um, I wrote a piece over at inside the reds.com. Why I don't think that there's a trade that I like with the Toronto blue Jays, the most recent rumor about who is trying to trade for Jonathan India. And that angered an entire continent. So I, I understand that there are other fans that are doing this where they look at Jonathan India's stats from last year and they say, we know who he is. You don't because that Babip says he's getting unlucky. His, his, you know, his, his counting stats like homers and RBIs and runs scored. Whenever you compare 2023 with 2021, you say, okay, he, he wasn't that great, but you must understand he actually played 50 
sorry, he played 150 games in 2021. He played 119 in 2023. He played 31 less games. So when you look at the per game averages based on homers, like he was hitting a homer every seven games. Um, he got, you know, two RBIs every three games. Yes, I was looking up these numbers and that's why I have them in my mind. But the 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 rate at which he accrued those stats, if you just take that from 2023 and you add in 31 more games, he hits the same amount of homers, he has way more RBIs, and he has the same amount of runs scored. So you're looking at those stats with 31 more games played, and you say, okay, if he was healthier, we would have felt better about his season. But then when you add in this luck factor, that's all you really need. Because the the BABIP of it all might seem too simple for you. So when you look at the other stuff, when you look at the plate discipline, you know, was he chasing too many pitches? Uh, was he making less contact? Was he making worse kind of, was he hitting more ground balls than fly balls? Actually, really the only difference between 2023 and 2021 was that he hit more fly balls in 2023. And because of that worse BABIP, Less of those fell for hits. That's really all it was. He still made the same uh, amount of contact, percentage of contact on pitches that he swung at. He still whiffed far less and chased far less, um, just like he did in 2021. He is a good plate discipline player. He has good plate discipline. Oh, that was a weird sentence. Anyway, he is a guy that when he's at the plate, you're not worried about him chasing really bad pitches because he just doesn't do that. And he didn't do that in 2023. His strikeout rate continues to be just above league average as far as, you know, being good, being low. His walk rate is above league average. So what is it? It's the BABIP. 45 point difference. That's that many, you know, that many batted balls that didn't fall for a hit that, that he got in 2021. Now, again, we we say he was lucky in 2021. He was unlucky in 2023. If you just bump up that Babbitt to league average from 281 to 297, that's a 16 point difference. You can reasonably expect his batting average to come up by like eight points. So then he's in the 250s. And it feels like in this day and age of baseball, we all mostly understand to the point that if you got a guy that's hitting at least 250, he's a fine, you know, he's an okay hitter. He's a pretty decent hitter. We, we tend to think that Jonathan India was this bad hitter because he hit in the 240s. It's all about the luck. Dude gets healthier. Dude gets luckier next season, which he will. He's going to bounce back. We're not even talking about, you know, some huge mechanical change or he's got to be better at, at recognizing pitches. We're just talking about luck. And I feel like because of the numbers that you see from 2023, you say it's time to time to move on from him. We can dive even a little bit further than that. Looking, and this is a microcosm. I know I'm not saying that all of the pitches are this way, but according to Baseball Savant, they show that based on the quality of contact he had against four seam fastballs, he should have hit 299 against that pitch, and he should have slugged 527. Those are great numbers, especially against a pitch that you're going to see the the majority of the time. But that was what he was expected to do. What he actually did was he hit 268 against four seam fastballs and he slugged 407. That's a batting average difference of 31 points and a slugging percentage difference of 120 points. The dude was unlucky. So say it with me. Jonathan Lucky, uh, Jonathan Lucky, maybe that's his new nickname. Jonathan India gets luckier in 2024. He's going to be better. That's where we're at. That's what I'm talking about. And look, I get it. The defensive argument is a worthwhile one that India does have a disadvantage in, but you take last l- lackluster defense with a good bat every single day. That's how Jonathan India won rookie of the year. The luck's going to come. And with good health, India will be the leader on the stat sheet that we know he is in the clubhouse. So what of it? How does this roster move if India deserves more playing time? I'll answer that coming up next. Before we do that, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, and that is FanDuel, because 
Baby, it's cold outside, but the promotions are heating up with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel and you haven't yet, I don't know what you're waiting for because now is the best time to do it. The app is so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. You can also combine prop bets on a game into a single game parlay for even more fun. I love doing that, especially if like I'm watching two random teams play. It's a great way to enjoy that game. Just a, just a microcosm, a micro, a micro bit more. And you can also check out future bets. I mean, if you're like me and you're thinking about the Reds and you're thinking about baseball here and, you know, Christmas time, you can look at some futures. I was looking at the Cy Young odds. These are kind of fun. Cy Young odds uh, for Cincinnati Reds pitchers. Hunter Green leads the Reds pitching staff in, you know, best odds to win the NL Cy Young. He's at 40 to 1. That's not great. I, I know that. But then you can also see Andrew Rabbit, who we'll talk about here in a few minutes. He and Nick Lodolo both have the same odds to win the NL Cy Young at 120 to 1. Yeah, you put $1. On Andrew Rabbit or Nick Lodola to win the Cy Young, you'll win $120 if they win. Just saying, you know, might be, you know, a little fun thing to throw throw out. I mean, you know, it could happen. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on today and, and start turning your sports knowledge into cash. FanDuel is an official partner of the NFL and the official sports book of Locked On. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. And coming up next on Locked On Reds, for all of our everydayers out there, how will the Reds' bats rank this season? I'm not talking about their gloves, just their ability to hit the ball. We're going to rank Reds hitters when Steve joins me tomorrow. And and uh, before we jump into, you know, where India is going to get its at, get his as bats in a crowded infield, got a quick Reds Fest update. Shout out to our buddy Scott Campbell on uh, the Lockdown Reds Discord page. He had asked, he had heard a rumor that the Reds were considering the Sharonville Convention Center for Reds Fest this next season. Because as you know, we, we talked about this on, uh, I believe it was a podcast last week. That the that Reds Fest will not be at Duke next next year and, and and really the year after that as well, because Duke is going under an eighteen month renovation. So where are they going to go? Sharonville rumored to be a spot would be nice. I live close to that. I did talk with somebody at the Sharonville Convention Center though, and they said that the Reds are just doing their due diligence, kind of reaching out. The biggest challenge for the Reds will be this: there is nowhere in Hamilton County or really for like a 100 mile radius of downtown that has the space requirements that they seek. Duke energy had a 200,000 square foot main, you know, the convention floor. They had a 40,000 square foot space where they had the poker tournament, the Reds hall of fame uh, dinner and all that stuff. And however many square feet it was, uh, you know, probably around 10,000 square feet for the kids area. There is no building outside of Duke energy that has that much space for them. So they're going to have to get creative with it. But again, Reds are in the early stages. They are looking for options on how to get Reds Fest, how to keep Reds Fest going these next couple of years without Duke, without Duke Energy and Convention Center. I just want to give you that update. All right. How does India fit into a crowded infield? I mean, let's be honest. In an infield that's like five or six deep, India, you have an argument there that India is the number five or the number six guy. Because the infield is crowded. We know this. Even with a bounce back, the argument can be made that he is still fifth or sixth on this four-man infield depth chart. There's plenty of creative ways, though, to get his bat in the lineup. A lot of it has to do with moving guys around. I mean, you still have the DH that's available, so you got five spots that you can reserve there with the you know, first, second, third, shortstop, and DH. But adding Jamer Candelario does make this infield group a little bit harder to kind of finagle. 
not not necessarily finagle, but I mean, Candelario is going to get everyday playing time. Matt McClain deserves everyday playing time with the way that he played in his rookie season. And then you look at Ellie and CES and Marte who have shown that they can be huge assets and deserve the kind of playing time they need to prove it. Like, I think Ellie definitely has the talent to be an everyday player. I don't necessarily know that he is marked there by the Reds. I think by us, by me, by you, we, we mark him as an everyday player. But as far as the Reds roster goes, Candelario and Matt McClain locks to play every day. And then you look at those other three guys, LECES and Marte as, you know, very close Marte and CES definitely with a much smaller sample size than Ellie, but with the struggles that Ellie had at the end of the year, as much as we said that, you know, there are underlying things that point to him bouncing back, he still struggled. So I don't necessarily know that he's being penciled into the lineup every day. As of this moment, I think he can earn his way in there. So how does everyone get playing time with India still in the mix? Because we entered this offseason thinking, is he going to get traded? Will he be traded? Will he be part of this team? We didn't think, you know, Candelario would be part of this team, but I definitely think that that was a good addition. So let's look at these six guys because they all have varying degrees of positional flexibility. Start with CES, first base DH, maybe right field. He played some in AAA, could be a thing. Matt McClain, second base shortstop. Ellie, shortstop, third base. Marte, third base, DH, maybe some right field too. Don't necessarily know that that is as much of a thing as CES, but we'll see there. Candelario will play the corners first and third base, and he'll be DH as well. And then India, second base and DH, definitely maybe some first base, maybe some outfield. I think that they're going to be creative in how they get India at bats. Because when you look at these six guys, it's hard for me to to envision, uh, you know, Jake Fraley, uh, definitely Spencer Steer, because Steve and I are going to talk about this more at length tomorrow. But when you think of the best nine bats, which I, I, I believe, and we had this discussion a little bit where, you know, we wanted the Reds to factor defense in there, but they're going to put the best nine bats in the lineup. Who are the best nine bats? All six of these guys should be in that top nine. No, I, I mean, I mean, you, you've definitely got Spencer Steer, who's going to play left field mostly, who's going to be in the top nine, and you got T.J. Friedel. And then, you know, you make the argument between Fraley or Benson, but do you put Benson or Fraley above any one of these six? Does Benson or Fraley make it in over CES, McLean, Ellie, Marte, Candelario, or India? You could probably make that argument, but... I think that the Reds are going to have plenty of ability to get these guys in here. We're thinking of it in terms of four infield spots and six infielders. But I definitely think there's going to be some movement. They're going to work out India at first. They're going to work out India in the outfield. They're going to work out, I think, that we'll see CES in the outfield, at least in spring training. I think that we might see Marte in the outfield at least in spring training, but those guys are athletic enough and CES has an amazing arm to play in right field. They have better arms than India does too. So I could see that working out, but I I think that there's going to be plenty of opportunity. Plus the one thing that we don't really want to talk about, nobody really wants to get that in depth on. There's going to be an injury or two. It's a long season. That's baseball. That just happens. Like when we look at six guys for four spots, we did this a couple of years ago. Whenever we said, boy, the Reds have like four, maybe five outfielders and there's only three outfield spots. And that was before the DH was a thing. We're like, they just got too many er, outfielders. How'd that work out? It works itself out. On paper is not where baseball's played. It's on field. And the other part that nobody wants to talk about, not all these guys are going to pan out. One of them might struggle a lot, and then you insert somebody else into that spot, and it works. To have options is where you want to be. For the fact that you look at this, these six guys, you look at CES, McLean, Ellie, Marte, Candelaria, and India, and you say, well, you got to trade one of them because you just got too many. That's a very flawed way to look at this. 162 games means you need depth. And I don't think about it in terms of player A has to get this many at-bats or player B has to get this many at-bats. 
How are they most effective to the team, and how does the team win the most games? Is it with that player getting that many at-bats? Then good, make that the condition. The idea is to win. The idea is not to give people stats. And as good as we talk about any of these players being, the ultimate goal at the end of the day is to win enough games to make the playoffs. And if you have that many, if you have this much ammo and you have this many darts to throw at that goal, then you're cooking. And that's really all we need to be worried about right now. And I'm very happy that the Reds have this kind of depth because everybody's going to get their at bats. And David Bell and Nick Crawl are going to work out a plan that gets this team wins with these bats. All right, let's switch gears to the pitching staff because Andrew Abbott reflected on his rookie season and has a clear goal for 2024 that should excite you because it excites me. We'll get to that next. Before we do that, though, I wanted to let you know you can follow us in between episodes. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Jeff Carr with three Fs. You can follow Steve at S. Offenbaker with two Fs. And you can follow the show at Lockdown Reds. Also, make sure to bookmark inside the Reds. Com. I'm writing over there. Steve is writing over there. Um, I, I had a written form of my India argument that just went up today. Had an argument about did the Reds actually miss out on Tyler Glass now? And like I mentioned, I also had an article where I angered an entire continent, Canada, uh, about not trying to trade Jonathan India to the Blue Jays because I'm not interested. Also, uh, you can join our community on Discord. I, I mentioned that earlier. Our friend Scott Campbell there on Discord. A lot of great uh, folks over there on Discord. Uh, Nathan and guys like that. Appreciate you all talking Reds all throughout the year. You can join a great community of Reds fans there on the Lockdown Reds Discord page. Got the link in the description of today's episode. We invite you to join. All right, uh, this was kind of exciting because Andrew Abbott was talking with Mark Sheldon. Uh, Mark Sheldon had a piece on MLB.com uh, with, with Abbott and a, a bunch of different quotes. And I was looking to see if I get some video. Couldn't find any video to show you guys. But there's a lot of great quotes in this because we talked a lot about Abbott and he had this just meteoric rise, right? He began, we, we forget this. He began 2023 in double a, he made 10 starts, I think between double a AA and triple a before being called up. Now he, you know, he came out of college and uh, 2021 and all this other stuff. So it, he was a little bit advanced, but he came from UCLA, not an SEC school. We, we always talk about, you know, when you're looking at a college prospect and they come from the SEC as opposed to other conferences, the SEC is almost like low A, like somewhere between the complex league and low A as far as the level of baseball that they play. All the other conferences are a little bit below that. And that's not, you know, that's not like bias or something. I'm not like an SEC homer here. That's just how scouts view it. But he was a little bit more advanced because he came out of college. So then he moves through the minor leagues, just on a meteoric rise. And he gets up here to the majors. He throws whatever it was. I'm, I'm blanking on the number. Got so many numbers running around my mind. I think it was 32 scoreless innings, something like that. It was probably not 32. That seems like an exaggeration. But he threw so many scoreless innings to begin his major league career. And we're thinking, who is this guy? This guy's amazing. And he kept on pitching well. He had great starts. And then he started to fall off a little bit. And then things started to unravel a little bit toward the end of the season. We thought, oh, okay, you know, he's a rookie. It's fatigue. Maybe the league's figuring out what's going on. He kept downplaying the fatigue angle of it. He uh, actually clarified this. And I, I was intrigued by this because when he was talking with Mark Sheldon, he clarified the whole idea of fatigue because we talked about, boys, is, is his arm giving out? What's going on here? This is what he had to say about that. Abbott said, uh, my arm was great. My arm was ready to go. But my body was just like, you know, maybe not getting 100% out of it, Abbott said. Maybe I'm only getting 90 or 80%, whatever it may be. I feel good. I can go. But you get to that certain point and my body just won't let me. That has an impact. It's not an excuse by any means. It's a good thing for me to know. And he, you know, he was kind of talking about he hadn't really learned. And, and, and you really don't. Like, if you're a baseball player, you really don't learn until you're at the major league level just how much stress major league baseball is on your body. And he mentioned, he's just like, I really learned that pitching was a whole body thing, and not just your arm or your legs or whatever. It's everything. And while my arm was good, my body was really fatigued. And so it was, it was interesting that he kind of finally 
admitted what we were all thinking. And, and in sure, I think that when you talk to a pitcher and you ask him, boy, is fatigue a factor? He immediately thinks, oh, you're worried about my elbow. You're worried about my shoulder. No, those are fine. Those are fine. It's so, no, the whole thing. I mean, he was, he was the savior of this starting pitching staff that was floundering for so much. So when he started to kind of dwindle a little bit, that's what was so, you know, so concerning. We're like, dude, the, you're the guy. And if you're the guy and things aren't going so well, then the rest of this starting pitching staff is in trouble because they didn't have Nick Lodolo and Hunter Green was off and on the injured list and Graham Ashcraft was off and on the injured list. And so you're just like, you got to be the guy. And he knows this because understanding the fatigue factor and what all goes into that, not just his arm, but his whole body, really, he has an amazing goal for 2024. And it falls in line with something that Steve and I have been talking a lot about. When we're looking for a pitcher, and we're even talking about this, you know, about trades or, you know, free agents or whatever. When we're looking for a pitcher, we want a guy who's going to give us like 30 starts. The Reds haven't had that guy for a few years now. We're looking for a guy that can give us a lot of innings. Andrew Abbott said basically the same thing we've been saying. He said, a big thing is longevity for me. I know to expect, or he said, I knew to expect to throw a lot of innings this year, but I want to throw even more next year. It's just about having 160 something innings as the floor and then being able to go deeper throughout the entire season and not having a dramatic fall off or anything like that just trying to be nice and stable the entire time. I love that. I, I, I'm, that's music to my ears right there. Andrew Abbott gets it. He understands that there's an element of pitching that, yes, while you can dominate this one start, maybe you're killing the Pirates today, right? Maybe you're just absolutely dominating the Cubs. Maybe you're shutting down the Cardinals and making them reconsider ever having a baseball team. But there's like 30 more starts you need to make. (laughs) So you can have a really good day today. But what's going to happen in five days? What's going to happen in 10, 15, 20 days? Andrew Abbott has his sights set on all of that. Yeah, you want to have a good start, but you want to have 30 good starts. It's not just about the one. It's about the whole thing. So for once in our lives, let's use this metaphor correctly. Andrew Abbott sees the forest for the trees. I love that. We need more players like that. We need, and and hopefully his mindset bleeds over into the other pitchers, maybe Hunter Green, Graham Ashcraft, Nick Lodola, maybe they all fall in line with that. And they all look at this as, look, it's 162 games. Or in the the case of a starting pitcher, it's 30 starts, 31 starts, 32 starts, whatever that ends up being. That's the goal. Can you imagine having a starting pitching staff? We're not one, but four or five guys throw 30 starts. We had that in 2012. Guess what happened? We won the division. I mean, that's the start right there. You had plenty of good performances in the lineup and on the the pitching staff and things like that. But I always go back to 2012 and that team was so much fun to watch. But the reason that they were so good was that pitching staff was so durable. Give me a durable pitching staff. Does everybody have to be a Cy Young contender? No. But if they're durable and they're giving you good starts, you know, good solid starts, you know, three and a half, four ERA, whatever it is, and you get 30 starts out of that guy, this team's making the playoffs. This team's winning the division. This team's a World Series contender because that's what World Series contenders have. They have durable starting pitching that allows the bullpen to, you know, be – Awesome when it needs to be, but also rest when they don't need them. The Reds didn't have that last year. The Reds bullpen was awesome when they needed them to be, but there was no rest period for them. They were just constantly on. They had to go every day because that starting rotation was not durable and was not reliable. That's what I want out of 2024. That's what Andrew Abbott wants out of 2024. Love it. Absolutely love it. Give me an Abbott jersey. Maybe I need a... We need to get an Andrew Abbott jersey. Hmm. Might, might, might be onto something there. Anyway, that's where we're going to end today's podcast. Thank you so much for joining today's Lockdown Reds podcast. If this is your first time, make sure that you're subscribed on your favorite podcasting platform. Make sure you follow me on YouTube and follow, uh, follow us on YouTube and, and click the bell to get notified whenever we've got new content for you because we're going to be with you 
all throughout the offseason as we lead up to spring training and pitchers and catchers reporting and all that good stuff as the Reds continue to improve to be a playoff team in 2024. Coming up tomorrow, Steve and I will discuss who are the nine best hitters on this team. So make sure you join us tomorrow because we will be locked on Reds every single day.